my pleasure to introduce uh, Charles Bordenaf. Uh, Charles is a French probabilist working in random graphs, random matrices, and spectral graph theory, among other things. Um, his work has been awarded the first prize Mark Yor in 2017 and the IMS Media Leon Lecturer in 2019. He is an associate of various prestigious journals such as Annals of Probability, Annals of Applied Probability, and Bernoulli. And uh, he is uh, now at Senate Advice. And, uh, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Charles, for this talk. Today he will talk about entropy of unimodular, unimodular processes on an infinite tree. Mm, thank you very much, Octavio, for the introduction. Uh, so it's my pleasure to talk today at this uh, colloquium of SIMAT. I hope that I will have the opportunity to visit uh, it for uh, once. Uh, so I will speak today about uh, joint work with Agnès Backhaus and Balash Chegedi, who are both in Hungary. And uh, there is an archive paper uh, which is related to what I'm going to talk about, which is available and uh, uh, okay, you can find it easily. Uh, so the title has many uh, complicated words, so I try to be. Uh, uh, the talk is simpler than the title suggests. Okay, so if you have any questions during the talk, do not hesitate to interrupt me. Uh, okay, so let's start. Uh, I will start with the definite notion of microstate entropy, which is a, a very fruitful notion, um, which has uh, been used in many different areas of mathematics. So let's start with the very basics. So you, you have a finite, let's call X a finite space, a finite set, and look at P of X, a set of probability measures on X, okay? And now when you have a vector uh, with coordinates in X, okay, so such an event like that, you can associate an, a probability measure, which we call the empirical measure of this vector, which is simply the measure which put a unit mass uh, to any uh, to any coordinate, okay? So for example, the, the, the mass that the, the empirical measure puts to X is just a, to a given uh, Y in your finite state space X, is just the number of coordinates which are exactly equal to Y divided by N, the total number of coordinates, okay? And uh, when you have a probability measure, uh, Shannon, uh, uh, there is this uh, uh, famous quantity called the Shannon entropy, which you can write like that, which is uh, the minus, it's uh, the expectation of the logarithm of mu of x, okay? The sum of mu of x log of mu of x, okay? Where mu is your probability measure. Uh, and there is a, so this is one formula for the entropy, but there is another one which uh, uh, in some sense is, uh, is not as nice and cute as the Shannon, the Shannon expression, but uh, it's uh, very useful uh, as I will try to convince you today. So it's uh, the way Boltzmann defined uh, the entropy in the 19th century. So instead of uh, expressing H of mu with this formula, there is another, inf uh, there is another formula, uh, which is the following. Uh, you, you, you count, so you have your target measure mu, and the, the Shannon entropy H of mu is also equal to, uh, you count uh, the number of vectors X, so absolute value is just a, a number of, it's a cardinal number. You count the number of vectors whose distribution is close to your target measure mu. So close, you take any distance D which, uh, uh, your favorite distance on the set of uh, probability measures. For example, the, the total variation distance, which is uh, D of mu, mu, which is a sum of uh, mu of x minus mu of x, okay? And you put a one half uh, here, for example. So it's one half the uh, L1 norm. For example, you choose this distance. So you count the number of vectors which are epsilon close to mu, and uh, you take the lim you look you you look you you take one over n log so you just look at the gross rate of that as n goes to infinity, and then you take the limit in n, in epsilon goes to infinity. Okay, and you get exactly the same expression h of mu, and this is uh, this is called the microstate entropy or 
because what you count, you count the number of microstates, or so the number of states of your system which are close to your target measure. Okay, so this, info, this Boltzmann formulation is in some sense uh, more, uh, is in some sense uh, indicates what, what the entropy can be used for. Okay, so there are many uh, other ways to define, there are many other entropies around, so this was just for finite set, for example, for a stationary process, uh, so you have a, a process indexed by Z, uh, and uh, you could define the entropy as being the limit of the entropy of your the first n coordinates. Okay, so this is a finite vector, so you can apply the Shannon formula divided by n, and this is called the Kolmogorov Sinai entropy. So it's a, the, a simplest version of the Kolmogorov Sinai entropy, because and uh, you can generalize this notion on a more general probability space and uh, what, and also with the proper notion of volumes here, since we, I mentioned just a case of discrete space, uh, it's just a uh, volume was just cardinal number, but uh, you can make it more, uh, make this setting in a much more general setting. Okay, so, and sometimes the, the, the microstate entropy has been used because uh, is, is useful because it gives you a way to define entropy uh, uh, starting from finite size objects that you can control. So this is this ID, for example. So uh, I don't, there is a generalization of the Kolmogorov Sinai entropy, which has been uh, proposed by Bowen, Kerr, and Lee, which is called the Sophic entropy, which is an, an entropy which is for when you replace stationary process, which are process indexed by Z, which, have, which are invariant by the automorphism of the, of the, of the line, the discrete line Z. You can consider process which are invariant by, you, you take a group and you can consider process which are invariant by the automorphism of, of the group, okay? And there is a notion for some process, which for some groups, which are called sophic, which you, if you don't know what it is, it's fine. Uh, there is a way to define an entropy of such process. It was not an easy task. And the idea is to use at a microstate. So coming back to a finite size object. Uh, okay, I will, the notion, this talk will be related to that. So we, uh, I will comment on this notion of entropy later. Uh, another notion of entropy, which uh, Octavio uh, knows uh, probably better than me, is uh, the Voigt coup free entropy. Uh, Voigt-Kurescu has defined uh, in the, the beginning of the year 2000 uh, a notion of entropy, which calls the free entropy, which is a, an entropy for uh, non-commutative uh, random variables. Uh, and the, idea, the way Voigt-Kurescu defined it is by con considering a kind of normalized volume growth of matrices, uh, which uh, you count the, the volume growth of matrices which approximate your non-commutative random variables. Okay, I don't want to be more specific, but this, there is the same idea to try to define a, an entropy on a very complicated uh, set uh, by uh, looking back to a finite uh, or much simpler object which we can control. Okay, so what the first part of this talk, I will try to make these ideas uh, work for a notion of, uh, define an, a notion of entropy, a microstate entropy, uh, for a notion of, uh, for a topology on graphs, which is called the benjamin Schramm topology, which I will now, now define for you. Okay, so uh, this is called the <coughs> local topology. So what is a, a rooted graph? Uh, a rooted graph is a connected graph with a distinguished vertex, okay? So you can picture it like that, you have your graph and uh, you, there is one vertex which is particular, and you call it the root. Okay, so you could you can you define the best G dot as being the set of locally finite rooted graphs. Locally finite means that all graphs have a finite have a finite degree. Okay, so you don't allow you do not allow graphs where, for example, one vertex has an infinite number of neighbors. Okay, and uh, sometimes the graphs are labeled, sometimes they are not labeled. So what does it mean? To, to be a label graph is that the, the vertices have numbers or you, you, you give them a name. And when they are unlabeled, the vertices are, un, are not, have no names. So uh, the mathematical way to, uh, to define an unlabeled graph is by just saying that you, you consider an equivalence class on rooted graphs by saying that two graphs, two rooted graphs are isomorphic 
if you can if you can find a bijection on the set of, of, of their vertices which maps the root of one of them to the other and uh, which maps uh, the edge and which the, which maps all the edges to the edge of the other okay and the equivalence classes are called unnumbered graphs okay so now when you have uh, but if you are not familiar with you can forget about this okay so uh when you have a, a rooted graph uh, since you have a root you have an origin and so you can look at uh, uh, you can look at uh, you have a natural notion of distance okay and when you have a graph and a t an integer you can look at g subscript t as a, as a rooted graph which is spanned by the vertices which has that graph distance as most t from the root okay so the graph distance is just uh, two neighbors they are distance one and uh, two and this guy is at distance two, two from this one is a number of minimal number of edges but you have to cross to go from one vertex to the other and uh, when you end though uh, and then this defines, you can define a, a complete metric separable uh, polyspace on uh, this uh, rooted graphs by defining a, a distance, which we can think about as a local distance, which is just be proportional to two to, to to graphs, rooted graphs would be close if they are coincide on a large ball. Okay. If there is a large T such that uh, the restriction to the T neighborhood are equal. Okay, but we are mainly interested by uh, graphs, not by rooted graphs. So this is where the, I, the central idea of Benjamini comes from. And take a finite graph like this one, which is not connected and has no roots. Okay, and uh, we will associate to it a, a neighborhood sequence. Okay, which is a set of for for vertex of this graph, you you could consider the unlabeled rooted graph rooted at v. So for example, if this is my graph, uh, G1 is this one. So I look at the connected component of one. Okay, so one is here, I put it here, and the, 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 the unlabeled rooted graph, what I see is this one. From when I root at two or three, I see exactly the same graph, it's with this one, and at four, it's with this one, and so on. Okay. And this sequence is called, the, for example, the neighborhood sequence. And now, exactly as Boltzmann did for uh, when you had a vector, you associate its empirical measure. We associate, we consider the empirical measure of the neighborhood sequence. Okay, so now what we have is a probability. This graph, we, we have started with a finite graph. Okay, this graph. And we associate to it a probability measure <coughs> on rooted graphs, which is the empirical measure of the. Uh, the empirical measure that you obtain from the rooted neighborhood sequence. Okay, so in world, you could think of that. Uh, a probabilistic way to think about this uh, measure is just what you look at the law of uh, your rooted graph when you root, the, the, when you put place a root uniformly at random. Okay, so with probability one over seven, I put it here, one over seven here, and so on. Okay. So this way you can move from finite graph to a to, to a rooted graphs. But what you when you have a finite graph, what you consider for in, in reality is a probability measure on a rooted graph. <coughs> and uh, since uh, this uh, the, the set of rooted graphs is a Polish space, uh, when you take the weak topology on the set of probability measure, it would be also a Polish space, and you can make a lot of uh, the usual framework of probability theory works. And uh, you can you say uh, that a sequence converge, a sequence of finite graphs, okay, converge in Benjamin Schramm sense to a measure rho, which is a probability measure on, uh, on rooted graph. So it's a random rooted graph. If its distribution converges to, uh, to a row up to the, this, uh, up to the labeling of the vertices. So that's what sometimes I put in that. It's a detail, forget about it. Okay, I will give you some example on the next slide, but uh, uh, let me uh, comment on one thing that uh, all, not all uh, random rooted graphs, so not all random rooted graphs can be Benjamin Schramm limits. Okay, due to the fact that we have taken the root uniformly at random, 
okay, when, you, when you redefine distribution of G. Uh, is there is a pro, an invariance property which you can think about as a stationarity property, which is called unimodularity, due to uh, if you know what is a, a unimodular measure on groups, uh, which is uh, which satisfies this property. Which <coughs> you take a function f, which which is a non-negative, and takes three values: a graph and two roots. Okay, and you, you, it has to satisfy for all such functions this. Uh, uh, mass transport principle, which says that, so when I write this, I mean the expectation when the graph of, when, uh, well, of the low row, when the graph GO has low row, okay? So the distribution, GO is a random rooted graph and its distribution is row, okay? So, so uh, the, on the left-hand side, you have the expectation with respect to the, the randomness of your rooted graphs of the sum of everything that uh, you can think of F, G, O, V as a, as a mass sent on the graph from O to V. This is the expected sum of, of everything which sends the root to the rest of the vertices is equal, should be equal to the expected sum of what the root receives. So this is what it is called the mass transport principle. Okay. Okay, so some example of benjamin schramm convergence. So if you take a finite grid and uh, of size n, then if you route it uniformly at random, it will converge to a, to a random uh, to it will converge to 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 a random routed graph, which is in fact not random, which is deterministic and which is just the usual the graph of Zd routed at its origin at any point. Okay. The reason is that when you, if you, if this is if this is your box of size n, when you take, you will see the boundary. So you will see the boundary. You will see that you are not. On, you make can make the difference that you are on a finite box or on ZD, if if the root is close to the to the boundary of the of the grid, okay. But the boundary is small compared to the probability that you you land with, let's say within distance ten from the boundary, is is, is going to to be very small when n goes to infinity, when n goes to infinity. Okay, so that's the reason why this result is true. <clears throat> if you take a, a random graphs, which says that all vertices have exactly d neighbors, and which has n uh, vertices, with n times d even, uh, then uh, you can sample one uniformly at random. And what you will see that the random graph that you obtain will converge in the Benjamin Schramm sense to the infinite irregular tree. So the infinite irregular tree is, let's say, d is equal to three. So this is the root of the tree, and then this is this. Uh, sorry, two. Okay. This is uh, the beginning of the infinite irregular tree. Okay. And uh, in the same vein, an Erdős Rani random graphs with parameter n and d over n, which means that it has n vertices, and you put an, an edge between two, two vertices independently with probability d over n, will converge to a random tree, random rooted tree, which is a Galton Watson tree with Poisson or spring distribution. So the Poisson distribution is a put a mass uh, k uh, to the probability that the Poisson. Uh, so the annotation is very bad. Uh, okay, it's the Poisson with parameter d. If n has this uh, distribution, the probability that n is k, let's say, k is exponential minus uh, d. Uh, well, there is a one over k factorial and d to the k. Okay, this is a Poisson distribution. And so, what is this random tree? So, you, the root as a distribution as a Poisson distribution. So, you start from the root as a the number of uh, of springs or neighbors, which is an independent variable with this law, and then uh, you take all of springs of the roots. So these three guys here, they sample. They have independent uh, Poisson distributed number of up springs, and you repeat that indefinitely. The tree can be finite or infinite, but you repeat it until you are done. Okay, and then essentially all graphs. Uh, all, all graphs whose degrees are uh, essentially bounded uh, have uh, Benjamin Ishram uh, converging subsequence. Okay, 
Uh, so now, uh, but I hope that you are more or less okay with the topology. I want to define, I want to come back to this problem of uh, finding a good notion of entropy and uh, I will use microstates. Okay, so what is that in this setting? So I will define G and M as a set of graphs on N vertices and M edges. Okay, and, and okay, so M will be depending on N, okay, but I will not write it explicitly. And uh, in such a way that uh, 2m over n goes to d, okay, uh, as n goes to infinity. So why do, what, what does it mean? That mean since 2m is the sum of the degrees of the graph by the unshaking lemma, it means that I'm considering of a graph where the average degree of a vertex is d. Okay. Uh, so the set of such graph is very easy to count. It's just a way to put images to put uh, images on, a, on all possible set of edges, and uh, you can <coughs> use Stirling formula to find uh, what, is, what is this number. So it's, okay, so there is a term which is of order n log n, and there is a more interesting term which is of order n. Okay, so this will be the term which will be interesting for us. Okay, so now I come to the microstate entropy, I fix a unimodular, uh, I, I fix a, a, a random rooted graphs, a low and random rooted graphs. Okay, I, I assume that it is unimodular because I know that the only limit I have to care about from Benjamin Schramm topology are unimodular graphs. Okay, so I take a unimodular graph. Uh, okay, so this is an inf possibly infinite random rooted graph. And now I count uh, I count and I look at the set of graphs on n vertices and m edges so whose distribution, okay, so the neighborhood distribution, okay, is close to rho up to epsilon. Okay, so this is a finite set. And d is any distance which generates a weak topology. So choice of distance will not matter for the definition of the microstate entropy. Okay, so provided there is a limit I will define, what I would not call the microstate entropy, in uh, the honor of Boltzmann will be this number. So I, exactly as we did, I, I look at the number, the log of the cardinal of this set, okay, uh, normalized properly, uh, divided, okay. I look at the normalized number of graphs, uh, which are epsilon close to, to my target distribution row. I take first the limit in N and then the limit in epsilon, okay. So provided that the limit are well defined, this would be a candidate. I could call that the, the sophic entropy. Uh, sorry, I could call that the, the microstate entropy for the Benjamin Schramm topology. Okay, so I have computed with a colleague a long time ago, six or seven years ago. We have computed this number, so I will explain you. There is a close for formula, which I will tell you. So first, <coughs> uh, if the degree of the root <coughs> If the expected degree of the root is different from d, okay, so recall that uh, m, the average m over n converged to 2d. Uh, no, 2m over 2m over n converged to d. So if the average degree is does not coincide with the average degree here, uh, then the this number is minus infinity. Okay, and it's also the case if rho is not supported on trees. Okay, so my, the definition of microstate entropy is meaningful for. Uh, is most meaningful for uh, for random trees, random rooted trees. Okay, and now I will give you the formula for sigma of rho when rho is supported on trees, uh, which has a good uh, degree. Okay, so it will take me uh, one detour uh, to, to give you a, the formula is nice, but uh, it's compact, but uh, I have to introduce a, a new notion, it will be okay. Uh, so how do you, so it's about labeling. And uh, so I told you, that, so I, I have a, a, a rooted tree and uh, I will use, uh, I will give you a, a way to, 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 see, to, to, to put it random labels. Okay, so it's quite easy. So you have the, the root, imagine that your tree is like that. Maybe I should not make an example too complicated. Maybe this is my tree, so it's rooted. So this is a root. Okay, this is a tree which is given to me and uh, it has no labels. I know that the root is here and this is my tree. I want to put a random label. So what I do is, so I 
So it has three neighbors. So I put labels on the neighbors uniformly at random. Okay, so from one to the degree. And then these guys, I this guy, I will call it, for example, three, two, three, one, three, three. And so every time I will I put uniform random number. So I have no choice, one, two, and for example, two, 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 one. Okay. So at each step, I put I order the offsprings uniformly at random from one to the degree minus one. Okay. And this give, this give me a random a randomly level tree. <coughs> okay. Uh, now we are ready for the. Uh, now we are ready for the formula. So, if the degree, if the expected degree of my of my random rooted tree is d. Then the sigma of rho, the the, 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 the microstate entropy, will be equal to a, a decreasing limit of something which is called sigma of t over t. What, what is sigma t? So there is just sigma t of rho. What is this sigma t? So I know it is not increasing. This is the entropy of a ball of radius t plus one. So this is st, and this is. Uh, T. So this is simply the look at S is for star. So it's a T neighborhood of a star. So it's a ball of radius T. Okay, so this is a ball of radius T plus one. So this is a ball of radius T plus one around the root. And what is the entropy of this guy? So it's a difference, the sigma of T of rho is a difference between two entropies. The entropy of the rooted tree restricted to this ball of radius T plus one, which I call S of T minus d over 2 the entropy of uh, the entropy of a, a t uh, uh, sorry uh, it should be consistent so yeah so it's t minus 1 so here it's uh, st okay so sorry uh, I'm, okay with this notation st is exactly a ball of produce t uh, so st so it's an s and, and what is et et so this is et et is a t minus 1 neighborhood of an edge Okay, so E of t is a t minus one neighborhood of an edge, and S of t is a t minus one neighborhood of a star, which is a, just a ball of radius t around the point. Okay, and the difference of these two entropies, uh, in fact, you can prove that they are non negative, and uh, they are limit. Uh, uh, no, sorry, uh, these are no. They are, uh, and their limit is uh, is decreasing in t. Sorry, is decreasing in t, and their limit uh, is sigma of rho. Okay, so this is a, a very strange formula because uh, you can so an h of t is a usual channel entropy. So I forgot to say that. So the the microstate entropy that you obtain from Benjamin Schramm convergence is a difference between two channel entropies. Okay, which is the entropy of a ball minus d over two times the entropy of uh, a neighborhood of an edge. Okay, so here there is an arrow, okay, because I did not define you properly what is a, what is a, a t minus one neighborhood of an edge, okay? So there is an extra slide. So what is t? Is t is a, is a, is a, is a, is a, is a distribution, if t is a random, okay, and, and t is a randomly level realization of my, of my uh, rooted graph. Uh, what it tree row, okay? So that's why I had to introduce this randomly leveled, uh, uh, this random leveling. So what I should say, if you go in this paper of uh, me and uh, Pietro Caputo, where we prove uh, this formula, in fact, the formula is not the same. And uh, because we did not use this notion of random, random leveling and the formula is very ugly, but when we, I realized when I was working with uh, my co-authors today, that this form, the formula was, in fact, could be written in a very nice way uh, when I use random labels. Okay, so I have to define for you what is this uh, t hat. So it's a, uh, this is simply a bias, a bias, you bias, so you have a random tree. Okay, and so you can define another way, another probability distribution of random multi trees, which I did not buy, a uh, realization of this random variable, or I did not buy t with a, with a with an arrow, and the probability that it is this random tree is given to something is it's uh, just the expectation that your tree uh, under the, the 
the law of t, but the expectation where you bias by the degree and divide by d. In particular, if the degree is zero, this is zero. So you, you can realize it's easy to check that zero one, but the degree is at least one uh, for t. Okay, so in particular, the, there is always an edge. So you can wait, you, this way you can define the E of t properly. Okay. But if you skip that, it's okay. Okay, so you can prove uh, many things about this. Uh, so I recall you that sigma of rho was the limit, the decreasing limit of this quantity sigma t of rho. And so they are non-negative and, uh, and they are decrease. And uh, the case of equality, you have an equality if and only if you have some uh, uh, spatial Markov property, meaning that uh, if I just be uh, schematic, that the green and the red part are independent when you condition on this uh, gray part. And you can also have exa compute exactly the maximizers of the entropy, meaning, for example, that you look at. Uh, so I, I have some uh, Spanish accents on my PDF, I don't know why. But, uh, uh, for example, we know what is, a, the, the, what is a, the random label tree, uh, the random, uh, sorry, the random uh, rotate tree, uh, which maximize the, the microstate entropy sigma of rho, a condition on, to the restriction that it's T neighborhood has some distribution. Okay, so this maximizer is unique and uh, you can describe it. For example, if you just look at the, the global maximizer of the entropy without any constraint, it is you retrieve the Galton Poisson, uh, the Galton Watson tree, this random tree with Poisson offspring distribution with, this, with parameter Poisson of parameter D. Okay. Uh, okay, so the usual motivation with Pietro Caputo uh, was to prove some large deviation principle, but uh, on Erdos-Schoening graphs, but let's forget about that. Another consequence is uh, that uh, I, I told you that uh, that uh, random routine, that Benjamin Ishram limit had to have this unimodular property, and uh, from our result, you could deduce a converse. But if you have uh, if you have a rooted tree which is unimodular, then it must be a Benjamin Ishram limit, so a, a, a kind of sequence of a finite sequence. It is a, a sequence. It is a limit for some sequence of finite graphs. The Benjamin Ishram limit for some sequence of finite graphs. So this is called Sophic. This result was already known, but uh, we gave a new proof. And it's called the Bowen Elect theorem. It's, it's not known whether or not all unimodular graphs, rooted graphs, are Sophic. Mm, probably not, but it's open. And uh, I, I mentioned to you this. Uh, I mentioned, I express, I explain you the, uh, this result for uh, graphs, and uh, but you can uh, put also weighted graphs when you put weights on the vertices or on the edge. And what is funny that you, the formula for for the microstate entropy is exactly the same. Okay, so it has been observed by Delgoshan and Darn independently. Okay, now I would like to, uh, in the time remaining, I would like to speak about a more recent work, which go one step further and uh, which come back to, now we want to define an entropy for invariant processes. Okay, so I will start with regular graphs. And if you, uh, if you are a bit uh, lost in my explanation of the Benjamin Schramm topology, you could try to, uh, to come back, uh, to try to re-understand from here because there will be less profit. Okay, so for simplicity, uh, we will restrict to, an, we take an, the infinite d-regular tree, okay? You take f and a finite set, uh, the uh, regular tree with d larger than three, okay? So for example, this guy. And so on. Now you consider a process, which is a random variable where you put, it's a process uh, it's with, uh, where you put a, a value on each vertex of the tree you a node of the tree, you put a random number, a random element in F, okay? Because you could call that a process. Uh, and you say that if this process is invariant, if it's low, is invariant under all automorphism of the group, uh, of the tree, okay? So this is called an invariant process of the infinite circular tree. Okay, so now 
we want to define a notion of uh, a good notion of entropy for such processes. But before that, uh, we will uh, I will I will def first define a class of process which has been introduced by my co-authors uh, Esbakaus and Balajegedi, which are called typical processes. <clears throat> okay, for that you first have to recall that if you when you sample a uniform Dirichlet graph of n vertices. It converges in the Benjamin Schramm sense to my infinite Dirichlet tree. Okay. So what will be a typical process? Okay, it will be a process uh, which is a Benjamin Schramm limit of a f value a coloring or a good a f a f color coloring is just a, I put colors which are just elements in f my set of can think of my finite set as colors. And uh, so a typical process would be a process on the tree, an invariant process on the tree, which would be the Benjamin Schramm's limit of some colorings of a uniform Dirichlet tree, Dirichlet graph. So I will give you a formal definition. So you have a finite graph, you, f, you take f, which is a vector, uh, you can see a vec an element of f to the v, either as a function, a coloring, which you put a uh, an element of f, we attach an element of f to each vertex. Okay, and the pair formed by g and this function is a vertex color graph. Exactly as I did, we could, you can define distribution of g of f, which is a random uh, rooted color graph, uh, which is an empirical distribution of colored neighborhood. So this is a law of a random color, uh, rooted color graph. Exactly as I did when yeah, there were no colors, but if I put colors, uh, everything I mentioned, I explain you carries over. And now the, the process you would say that the process on the tree with low, let's say mu, is weakly typical if whatever if you fix an epsilon, you look at the the probability. So it's a you look at the so Gn is a uniform Dirichlet graph, okay, and you look at the probability. Well, the, this is the expectation with respect to GN. Okay, you look at the probability of the following event that there exists a coloring whose distribution is close epsilon close to mu. Okay, <coughs> epsilon close for any distance you like, uh, which metrizes the weak topology. Okay, and you say that this is weakly typical if the limb limb sweep of that is equal to one for any epsilon, meaning that it. In words, it's weakly typical if, the, if along some sequence of subsequence of n, there exists a, a sequence nk, a subsequence nk of integers, such that when you sample a, a random a random Dirichlet graphs with this number of vertices, with high probabilities, there will exist a coloring which approximates a mu. Okay, and you say strongly typical if here you put a limit. Okay. Uh, meaning that for all sequences, for all n, uh, this is true. Uh, to motivate this definition, let's take, for example, a psi, uh, let's call psi a bounded continuous function on uh, unlabeled colored rotic graphs. Okay. So it's a function on graphs of. And uh, now you could define for a graph GVE. Okay, a graph, you could define this function, which is you look at the maximum over all possible colorings of the function that you get when you color the graph G with F. So for example, you could recover the Ising model. You could write V of V. This could be uh, a continuous function. Okay, so uh, no, maybe I will not make it continuous. Okay, for example, it could be, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe you want, uh, the sum of v of indicator that uh, maybe you want, if you have black and white, you would like indicator that v is black and all its neighbors are white. Okay. For example, and this, what you would get is what is called uh, this maximum number. So if the colors, if f is, uh, if v is uh, black or white, uh, what you get is uh, what is called L of g will then be what is called the uh, Max the independent set, the max the size of the maximal independent set. Okay. 
Now, if, if we take G, which is a uniform Dirichlet graph, then the, the, the fraction of L of G divided by N will be close to its, uh, its average. And you can also prove that the limb soup of the, of this, of, uh, of this, of the value of L of G, when you take the expectation and renormalize, it will be equal to the maximum of the expectation of the function psi when you take the, uh, so I could have written that so like that the expectation with respect to the low mu of psi of g f oh okay where the expectation uh, where mu is the maximum is uh, all weekly typical process you take all weekly typical process and this gives you you take this maximum you can write the value of this function the limb super is the value of this function as as a maximum of something that you can compute over typical processes. And if you put a limb limb, uh, here you put the same maximum, but you put strongly typical process. So in some sense, if you can prove, if you can have a guess of what are the set of typical process, weakly or strongly, then you can compute, uh, you can solve at once all combinatorial optimization problem on, on your, on regular graphs, on uniform, ran, uniformly random regular graphs. That's one motivation. Okay, so that's what I, I wrote here. And this kind of notion was look, was formalized by, uh, for example, Atami, Lovash, and Jegedi as a local global graph convergence, but it's okay. This idea that you want to describe all possible limit points, all possible colorings of a graph. Okay, and there is a, a conjecture, uh, which is, uh, the basis of this theory, which is it's, it's, a, it's a theory with a theorem, meaning that, that we don't know any uh, sequence of graphs, which is a local uh, non-trivial sequence of graphs, which is locally globally convergent. And the way to the way to phrase it in my language would be to the conjecture is that weakly typical process are strongly typical. So we don't know that we conjecture it's true, but we don't know that. Okay, so uh, granted with uh, our knowledge now on uh, entropy and microstate entropy. What I would like to do is to tell you that there is a strategy to try to prove this conjecture, which I don't know uh, today to prove, uh, but uh, there is an entropic strategy to try to prove this conjecture and much more, okay? This is by introducing a notion of sophic entropy, okay? And so I'm sorry this talk is a lot about definitions, but I think the definitions uh, are quite neat. And, uh, so uh, you take an invariant process on the tree, you take a Dirichlet graph on n vertices, and exactly as Boltzmann did, uh, we, we call, uh, you, you call h mu f epsilon, you look at the growth rate, so one over n log of the number of colorings of your graph, whose distribution is epsilon close to mu, okay? So you count the number of colorings which are on your graph, which are epsilon close to mu. So this can be minus infinity if there is known. So it takes value in minus infinity union uh, union uh, this set, this interval. Okay, so now if you take a random graph, which is a randomly sampled Dirichlet graph, I define a small hn as being the median value of that guy. So the reason I don't take the expectation, but since it takes value, it can be minus infinity. So expectation will be minus infinity with probability, positive probability, probably. So the expectation will, will usually be minus infinity, so it's not interesting. So we take the median value, okay, which is more stable quantity. <coughs> <coughs> it can still be minus infinity. But, uh, and then you define the sophic entropies as being the gross rate of these median values. Okay, so again, first the limit in n and then the limit in epsilon. So in words, this is a gross rate. H of mu is a count is a gross rate uh, of the number of colorings uh, that you can get, uh, which are close to mu, uh, on a random uh, on a uniformly random Dirichlet graph. Okay. Okay. So this definition of sophic entropy is in fact a kind of randomized version of the Bowen sophic entropy I was mentioning at the very beginning of my talk uh, on the free group. But, uh, okay, so this notion of entropy is also, uh, has also been proposed uh, in, a, in a, 
in a dynamic group theory. But uh, okay. And uh, so it can be shown that uh, this quantity, which is h, the number of uh, colorings of uh, on Gn, uh, which are close to mu, this is a random number. It is close to its median value. And as a consequence, you prove you can prove this uh, theorem or lemma that an invariant uh, a process an invariant low mu a process mu a process x with low mu is weakly typical if and only if the sophic the upper sophic entropy so we I put a bar up I call it the upper and the other one the lower the upper sophic entropy is non-negative and strongly uh, it's uh, you put uh, the same statement with a uh, Lower, uh, lower, the lower sophic entropy, and there is a conjecture. I mean, uh, we mentioned we, we have this conjecture, which implies a conjecture that weakly typical process are strongly typical, that the upper and the lower sophic entropies are equals, are in fact equal. Okay, uh, I will give you. So this is one, one motivation for introducing this sophic entropy. Uh, we not mention the, the motivation of Louis Bowen, but uh, I will mention another uh, yet another motivation for this sophic entropy uh, with respect to, we have seen that typical process, if you could compute the set of, if you had a good understanding of all typical processes, you could solve uh, at, at once all combinatorial optimization problems on the, uh, uniform diagonal graph. In the same way, if you can compute the sophic entropy, you can solve all what are called factor graphs models uh, or stat, uh, factor graphs model on, a, on your graph, on a random diagonal graph. So how does it go? So you take phi, a bounded positive continuous function on unlabeled color dotted graphs, okay, and you introduce this partition function. So you sum, you fix the graph, you sum over all possible colorings. And you take the product of all vertices of the value of your function. For example, you can have the, I don't know, the easing model. For example, if you have the sum of uh, sigma in uh, minus one one power n. I, I gave you an example of the easing model. You can, which is the expectation of beta times the sum of i j neighbors in uh, i and j neighbor in the graph of sigma i, sigma j. Okay, so this is the easing model and you can write it in this way. Okay, so it contains the easing model and essentially all statistical physics model that you can build on your uh, graph. So this is a partition function of all statistical physics model associated to a finite range or a local uh, interactions. Okay, so now then the color, you can think of them as pins. Uh, okay. Now, uh, so there are thousands of papers and models like that. Uh, so if Gn is a uniform Dirglar graph on n vertices, then it's asymptotic, it's free energy, which is the logarithm, the logarithm of the partition function uh, divided by n. It's, it's close to its mean, it's average. And you can prove that the limb soup of this number, this partition function, is equal to the maximum over all uh, invariant process of the upper sophic entropy of mu plus the, expect the expectation of log phi against mu. And you have the same thing with limb and uh, the lower entropy. So, so you see, if you can compute the sophic entropies, uh, you can prove, you can compute or uh, you can essentially uh, compute uh, the Boltzmann Gibbs measure of any uh, statistical physics model on a Dirichlet class, random Dirichlet class. <clears throat> okay, uh, that's what I said here. And this conjecture, uh, not in the, the, this, the, the fact that all the asymptotic free energy was converging, uh, appears, for example, it's a monograph of Talagran, and it has also been formalized as called by the right convergence in a nice paper of Gamma. So it's a conjecture. Okay, uh, now uh, uh, maybe I have ten minutes, so I will give. So I didn't mention you any result on the contained in the paper I wanted to talk about today, but it took some time to introduce the settings and some motivation. 
so I will give you some formulas, uh, uh, some upper bounds and matching lower bounds for the Sophie entropy and conclude. Okay, so I recall you the, this anime entropy. Okay, and uh, there was a result, uh, a theorem, uh, which uh, is stated like that in this paper by Bakash and Jagedi, but there are some versions of this, of this result by Bolobash uh, in the 80s, which says that if a process is typical, then uh, what I know now uh, is our uh, microstate entropy for the Benjamin Sham convergence, sigma t of x, which is this difference between the two channel entropies is non-negative. Okay, so when I saw this formula, I said there must be a connection with my previous work with Pietro Caputo. And in fact, uh, uh, we realized that a strong, we recover this result and that a stronger uh, result holds is that the upper sophic entropy is bounded by, my, by the microstate entropy. Okay, so the microstate entropy was the, the limit of this entropy difference. Okay, <coughs> say it's stronger because I recall you that for a process to be typical, uh, to be weakly typical, you must have the upper surface entropy to be non negative. Okay, and now it sheds, uh, so it says there is a connection between this microstate entropy and uh, my uh, sophic entropy. So, what it is, it's the connection is very easy. Uh, so I recall you that this, uh, uh, so it's a sketch of proof. So this, what is this sigma of x, this microstate entropy? By definition, if this is a number of colorings, uh, of colored graphs, so here I count the graphs and the color, and I, which I, I look at the set of, of uh, such colored graphs whose distribution is close to my target measure, and I divide by the total number of the regular graphs. And if I take the logarithm of that, the limit, and the okay, uh, then uh, from my result with Pietro Caputo, uh, this is this this is the expression for this uh, Sophie control, for this anil, uh, sorry, for this microstate entropy. Okay, so but since you divide by the number of graphs, you can reinterpret that as the expectation with respect to Gn, which is a irregular random irregular graphs of the number of colorings which are epsilon close to my target measure, okay? So this is equal to that because, it, because Gn is uniform, is uniformly distributed. And then you apply Markov inequality and you say that the probability that the entropy is larger than H, it's equal to the probability that the number of colorings is larger than exponential N times H, okay, because H, G, mu epsilon is one over log n of the number of colorings. Okay, so it's just equality. And then I apply Markov inequality. This is less than exponential minus h times the expectation of this number. Okay, and which is equal roughly to exponential minus h plus n sigma of mu or x plus little of n. So you see that for that to be, let's say, positive, uh, you have to have sigma of mu, which is less than, uh, you have to have h, which is uh, larger than sigma of mu. <coughs> okay, so, so, yeah, so that's the way you prove this upper bar. And so it's essentially the first mode method. Uh, and in this way, you see that the sigma of mu, my microstate entropy, you can interpret it as an annealed entropy. So what is this jargon of it? Uh, it comes from most statistical physics, and in, in the sense that the, in my entropy, in my sophic entropy, I count the number of colorings for a given graph. At anil entropy, what I, what I am counting in sigma mu, I've count the pairs of graphs and colorings, okay? And uh, this necessary condition of typicality has appeared in many papers and it's very useful. Okay, I don't have much time, so let's, see a toy example uh, to illustrate. So let's look at the coloring. Uh, I have two colors, uh, zero, uh, black and white, say. And uh, with probability one half, uh, the root of the tree is, uh, as co is, uh, as color, is white and all its neighbors, so, and all its neighbors are white. So this has probability one half. 
and with probability one half, this is a complementary. Okay, so I did not picture the rest of the graph, but so with probability one half, you have this configuration, and with probability one half, you have this configuration. Okay, so what we are trying. So the entropy of this, if you just for t equal to one, the, if you look at the entropy of the one neighborhood, uh, you can compute it, it's negative. As a consequence, uh, this, uh, as a consequence, this invariant coloring is not typical. Okay, and it has to do with the fact that uh, there is no way, if you take a random derivative graph, there is no way that you can see it as being close from being bipartite. But you can cut its vertices in two, let's say white and black, such that white vertices are only connected to black vertices and black vertices to white vertices. Okay. Let's look at another example where you have the same model, the same, but now I, I, I have my color set is F1 union F2. So it's a disjoint, uh, it's a disjoint union. Where the two sets F1 and F2 have, have, have size N. So what I do if with probability one half, I put the, the my so I have, uh, you can think of F1 as being shades of white and shades of uh, black. Okay. Uh, not to mention shades of gray, but okay. Uh, and so uh, with probability one half, the root has a color uniformly sampled in F1, and, and all other vertices have an independent color in F2, the neighboring vertices, and so on. When you do that, this process is not typical because it's a, it's a factor of this one, okay? If you just forget the shades and look at the white and black, if you can approximate this one, you can certainly approximate this one. So this process is not typical, but this Sophic entropy for n large enough is positive. Okay, so it means that this inequality is very nice, but it's not always tight. So it's not true that h of mu is that uh, it's not true that h of h of mu is is equal to sigma of mu. It's not true. It may be true, but it's not true for all processes. So what we did with uh, 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 Balash and Agnès, we proved uh, a matching lower bound, which is also as quite easy. So I recall you this. Uh, so now I call it the annual entropy. I used to call it the microstate entropy. But now uh, of a typical process X. So I recall the definition. Okay, and we have the following theorem, which says that you take an invariant process on the tree. Such so that for all invariant couplings, <coughs> I will tell you. So what is a coupling? I will tell you in a second. So for all invariant coupling, no, I should tell you the first. So what is a coupling? So I, you, you have a, my process. I have my, so a coupling is, so I, I have my tree. So now it's, uh, so I have my tree. Okay, so let's say that, uh, so this is a realization of X. What I want to do is on the same probability space, I want to define a realization of another process, why? Okay, uh, such that, so you can see of x, y as being a coloring on f uh, with, uh, on f square. Okay, because uh, if you look at the, this, so this is a root, this is the same root. And here, here it takes value in f, here it takes value in f, on f also, so you, so you realize that these two variables, these two, two F colorings, so you can see that as a F square coloring of, it has to be, so, and now you say that it is a coupling. If it, it's a coupling of F, so this is called a coupling, it should be invariant, so meaning that this pair of random variable uh, should be, uh, invi should define an invariant process, okay? So invariant by all automorphism of the tree. And then you will say that uh, it is uh, an invariant coupling of X and X if X, as distribution x, okay, and y as the same as, as also distribution x. Okay, so if for all such invariant coupling, so for all possible ways to build this random variable y in such a way that y has low x, uh, sigma of x is less than sigma of x plus sigma of xy is less than sigma of x plus sigma of y. So since x and y are the same, always the same thing as that. If this is true for all invariant couplings, then the upper and the lower Sophic entropies are equal and they are equal to my annual entropy. And X is typical. Okay. Uh, 
How much time do I have left, Octavio? Maybe you can just almost finish, maybe three, four minutes. <laughs> okay, that's <laughs> fine. Uh, so for example, if you look at, uh, to mention this notion of coupling, I could look at X equal to Y. This is a coupling, okay? Uh, uh, if X is equal to Y, uh, so if X is equal to Y, uh, sigma of XX is equal to sigma of X, okay? And then so, and, and this inequality implies that sigma of X is less than two, two times sigma of X which implies that sigma of x is non-negative. And we know that it should, because we know that if the process should satisfy that, it should be typical. And this was a necessary condition for being typical. And, uh, and this bound, the sigma of xy less than two sigma of x, is rich when x, when y is independent of x. OK, and you can cook the, my counter example, and you see it will, it will work. OK, so the proof is the, uh, we not do it now because I'm out of time. But the, we see that there was this uh, uh, lower bound on Sophic entropy by using this first mode method, uh, this upper bound on Sophic entropy sorry, for using this first mode method. And the lower bound is by using what is called a second mode method. But uh, I will not, there is no, it's not very fancy. OK. So then there is a generalization for, so I, I've mentioned. Uh, random regular trees, but you can do that for more general trees, which are called unimodular gauss nodes and trees. But uh, you have the same formulas. Uh, let's we skip that. So let's conclude. OK, so uh, so there are, I've mentioned some results. So in fact, in the paper, we have archived there are some final results for the Sophic entropy when the process X, when the invariant process X has some Markovian structure. And the method is very robust, and uh, it can be uh, Extended to other graph ensembles, and uh, for example, you can we can look at uh, a uniform. Probably there is a parallel story for uh, when you take inst when you replace these uh, random regular graphs by uh, uh, uniform trees with n vertices. Mm, but uh, okay, we didn't work that out. But this probably the same program could be carried over. Uh, more interestingly, uh, there are some tight connection with statistical physics. And uh, this notion of Sophic entropy, and there are a lot of, uh, so it has some connection with uh, what people in statistical physics call a random constraint satisfaction problems, which are, for example, uh, uh, the Ising model. Well, if you look at the Ising model or the, any statistical physics model with finite range interaction, uh, there are some uh, sometimes theorems, sometimes conjecture about the limit, for example, of the free asymptotic free energy. Okay, and this type of formula, they are called Parisi type formula for by, because Parisi in the 80s has, was the first to establish such type of formula on the famous statistical physics model called the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model. But uh, using this uh, non rigorous statistical physics method, uh, you could come up with a conjecture value for the Sophic entropy, okay? Which, so I, I have, a, an, I have a, for a complicated formula, but explicit for what should be the conjecture, the conjecture value for the Sophic entropy. So if I manage or someone managed to prove that this is indeed the correct answer, then you would prove this conjecture that's upper on the so, uh, lower Sophic entropy coincide, and you, we would have an explicit form, explicit expression for it. So I think this is a very nice uh, research program. And uh, the same vein, you can write down a conjecture for the set of processes. You can find a necessary and sufficient condition for the set of processes whose Sophic entropy is, uh, is equal to the anise entropy. OK. And uh, yes, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. <coughs> Uh, I, I open the uh, discussion and for questions. So maybe I can I can start uh, with a, a very maybe with a very simple question and then with another. One. So uh, so maybe if you go back to your toy example about uh, these. Uh, yes. Uh, 
two colorings. Yes. With a coloring with, with, with two colors. Yes. Uh, here, yes. Exactly. So, so, so you said uh, ah, that. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Ask your question. Okay. So, 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 so basically, you said that, that uh, this process was a typical or was not typical, uh, basically, because uh, a T regular graph uh, is uh, not by 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 part. Yeah. Right? It's far yeah. from being by part. Yeah. So, so, so can, can you? With this kind of quantities, for example, can, can you get the chromatic number of the uh, regular graph? <coughs> mm. Okay, so uh, for for the chromatic number, so these physicists they have a, have a conjecture value for the chromatic number of any D regular graph for any D. Uh, so the chromatic number uh, compared to the independent set has some extra constraint. But it is uh, it is called hard constraints, meaning that uh, uh, for so for the column, so you you could what what this method could give directly would be a, con a value for the for the essentially chromatic number, which would be uh, essentially meaning that uh, you allow a vanishing proportion of uh, edges to be uh, not properly colored. Okay, so you could have a vanishing proportion of vertices which have uh, neighboring vertices which have the same color. Okay. So if you do this relaxation of colorings, then uh, you are exactly in this setting. If so, in the usual chromatic problem, you don't allow this uh, vanishing proportion. So then uh, uh, what you have to do is first to prove this uh, relaxed version and then by some uh, there are some techniques, for example, Erdoshoni graph, for example, it's called the sparkling method. There are some techniques to prove, and then if you do that, but the relaxed problem, the art constraint problem can be solved using the relaxed problem up to some, uh, you have to do some finite end surgery, which is uh, sometimes difficult and sometimes ugly, but usually you can do it. Okay, so yeah. probably yes, the answer is yes. So you, if, I, if you manage is a, if this program, if you can prove a formula for the sophic entropy, you will have proof also this conjecture on the, on the chromatic number of the regular graphs for ND. Okay. And, and maybe regarding the first part, you talked about the, the minimizer, which was this Galton Watson process. Yes. <coughs> is there some reason or interpretation why this is the minimizer? So, so in, in, in the entropy is minimized by very special laws, for example, like in the classical setting by the Gaussian, in the field setting by the... So is there yeah. some central limit theorem or, or something why this, mm. this process is special? This okay, it's uh, a good question. Uh, uh, or is it uh, something like that? Yes. Yes. Uh, so, for example, uh, the fact that you get the Poisson Galton Watson tree. Yeah. And so, so I recall you. So, you, you look at GNM, which is a, a n regular graph with m vertices, and m to m over n is like d. So, this is essentially an Erdoshoni graph with n vertices, and you put each edge, if you take a random element here, it's very close to be an Erdoshoni graph with you, you put each edge with a d over n. Independently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My question is if. if, if so, so, uh, so you and you see where the Poisson distribution comes from here, just at the beginning of uh, at the step zero. So, why is the max the global maximizer of the entropy is uh, use the Galton Watson tree? You can realize it as uh, it's quite, for example, it's quite easy because you will see it's, it has to maximize entropy. So, you look at the degree distribution of that guy. So it's a binomial with parameter n and uh, n minus one and d over n. So it's close to be a Poisson. So you look at the neighborhood of a, of a vertex. It has to be the number of degrees has to be Poisson distributed. And then you look at the neighbors of his of his neighbors. Then if you want to maximize randomness, it will be there will be no cycles, and it will be again Poisson distribution. So this way you can try to uh, guess why the this Poisson Galton Watson tree plays a special role. 
And then uh, this, these trees are kind of generalization of that, but it's, I mean, Galton Watson tree, it's a, uh, uh, let's say, when you want to max, maximizing uh, entropy is about uh, maximizing randomness or, okay. Okay. And Galton Watson trees have this, uh, these are these tree where give, was a, given the, the tree constructed so far, everything is independent. So they are in some kinds maximizing, they are objects which maximize some randomness among all rooted trees. So it's quite natural that you have these Galton Watson trees. But the way you define them properly, because you, you want to Galton Watson trees, but you restrict the law of, for example, the ball of radius three. And uh, it's a bit tedious, but you can do that. Okay. So, so the fact that it got on Watson tree, it's reasonable. But uh, I don't have much, no, I don't have a more uh, satisfactory argument in my mind at the moment. Okay. So are there any more questions or comments? <coughs> It seems not, but uh, thank you very much for your very nice and interesting. Thank, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the attention. And uh, okay, so.